God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. We have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which has on average been in a state of cosmic expansion cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we can't yet provide a physical description of the first split second of the universe. But the Borg-Guth-Vilenkin theorem is independent of any physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state, which may have characterized the early universe, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have had an absolute beginning. Of course, highly speculative scenarios such as loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been proposed to try to avoid this absolute beginning. These models are fraught with problems, but the bottom line is that none of these models, even if true, succeeds in restoring an eternal past. Last spring at a conference in Cambridge celebrating the 70th birthday of Stephen Hawking, Vilenkin delivered a paper entitled, Did the Universe Have a Beginning?, which surveyed current cosmology with respect to that question. He argued, and I quote, none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. He concluded, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. But then the inevitable question arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the universe into existence? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. One, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause. Three, therefore, the universe has a transcendent cause. By the very nature of the case, that cause must be a transcendent immaterial being. Now, there are only two possible things that could fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, has no effect on anything. Therefore, the cause of the universe is plausibly an unembodied mind or person. And thus we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Now, in particular, many of the arguments that Dr. Craig gave tonight, and which he has given repeatedly in the past, rest on the first cause uh, uh, argument, an argument that goes back certainly to uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and probably to Aristotle. Um, and it rests on, of course, the principle of sufficient reason, the principle that everything that exists must have a cause. Now, the remarkable thing about this argument uh, and the principle of sufficient reason, as it's called, on which it rests, is that the principle is plainly false. Okay? It's refuted trillions of times every second throughout the universe. It's refuted in this room, and I'll give you an, an, a, a pretty full explanation of why. Take two uranium-238 atoms, okay, that are absolutely indistinguishable. In a given moment, these two indistinguishable atoms, atoms of exactly the same mass and energy state, uh, have the following difference. One produces an alpha particle spontaneously and the other doesn't, and there is no cause whatsoever for that difference. That's what quantum mechanics tells us. Suddenly one admits an alpha particle, 
and the other doesn't, and there's no cause whatever for that difference between them. Now, you might think that that's not a very important、uh, fact of nature, but one mole, one Avogadro's number of uranium 238 molecules emits three million alpha particles a second, and every helium atom on this planet is one of those alpha particles. And the smoke detectors that operate all through this auditorium to protect us from fires, those operate because of the indeterminate, unexplained, completely spontaneous appearance of an alpha particle out of a uranium atom in these、uh, systems.、Um, for Dr. Craig to insist on uh, uh, the arguments that rest on the claim that every event had a cause. That had to have brought it into being is just bluff, right? It's not a principle accepted in physics,、uh, and you can't argue from it for it for from its intuitive、uh, attractiveness. As for the origin of the universe, he says, but、uh, not everything has a cause. In quantum mechanics, virtual particles come to be without a cause.、Uh, notice that he misstates the first premise. Uh, which is that the universe began to exist, and then the second, if the universe began to exist, the universe has a transcendent cause. That's because the universe can't come into being out of nothing, and virtual particles don't come out of nothing. They come out of the quantum vacuum, which is a sea of roiling energy. Moreover, in quantum mechanics, it's not clear that these、uh, entities are in fact uncaused. There are deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics. According to which the behavior of these particles is fully determined, and finally,、uh, number three, I would say in response to this, that uh, on uh, the origin of the universe, you have to believe the entire universe could come into being from non-being in order for it to come to exist without a cause, and I think that takes more faith than belief in the existence of God. One of the central arguments of the God delusion, Richard Dawkins' book, is the famous schoolboy argument: If we believe in a creator, we'll have to ask who created the creator. Now, the first point I would make about that is this: If you ask the question "Who created God," you are thinking of created gods. Now the ancient world knew all about created gods. Actually, we call them idols, and people don't believe in them usually nowadays. So, if Richard Dawkins really thinks that what he's demolishing is belief in created gods, then good for him. But he could have written a far shorter book because millions of us don't need any convincing that created gods are a delusion. So that's the first point, and I believe it's quite a serious point actually. Because if he thinks that the God means you must be able to say who created God, then he does fall foul of that criticism. Now you can only ask the question coming at it from another perspective: if you cannot conceive of an eternal God, Christianity, of course, does not believe in a created God; it believes in God who is eternal. And is the creator of everything else. In other words, God is uncreated. So what I'm claiming to use mathematical language is that the category of the uncreated is not empty. Now it could be that Richard Dawkins has difficulty with the notion of the uncreated, although, and I'd like to know the answer to this. I don't know the answer to this. Does he believe that matter and energy have existed forever? Because if he does, as many people do who are atheists, then they do believe in something eternal. So the problem must be that they can believe in something eternal, but they don't believe in an eternal person, an eternal God. But where's the logical difficulty? If you admit that something eternal admits exists, then postulating that an eternal person exists. On the other hand, if they believe that matter and energy are finite, we can ask them their own question: Who created that, and who created whatever created that, and so on? You have an infinite regress unless you can see that the buck must stop somewhere. And of course, the Christian doctrine is that God 
existed eternally. So that by definition, the, the creation buck, so to speak, stops there. So I really think that in a way, the game is given away by asking that question. Dawkins is thinking of created gods, which are a delusion. All right, there's been one objection to the fact of saying that out of the Big Bang, we can posit that there's a transcendent creator, a cause that it, we would say is God, okay? And that line of reasoning goes is that, hey, out of that first second, there could have been many, many universes, multi-universes that were created, any one of which, well, you, you explain the theory. What is the multiverse theory of this? Well, it grows out of the concession that we see overwhelming evidence in the characteristics of the universe that makes life possible in the universe. But those who do not want to go down a theistic or a Christian path would argue that if we have an infinite number of universes, then all those universes have different physical characteristics, then we could possibly conclude that our universe has the just right characteristics for life and human beings by pure chance. Now, when you make that appeal, it is a metaphysical appeal. And that's because Einstein's equations of general relativity tell us that once you've got observers in universe A, the space-time envelope of that universe cannot overlap the space-time envelope of any other possibly existing universe. All right, so what you're saying is, okay, we've got our universe, right. and uh, it's been here, what, 15? Uh, 13.7 13. 13. Billion, billion years, our universe, okay? Right. And out of that, the evolutionists, the scientists would say, there's not enough time for life to originate by chance in 13.7, so we need another spot. We actually have to appeal to different physics to make it work. Okay. If you stick with the physics we have, you've got a universe. The multiverse is an appeal to a so fundamental... So you're stuck. If you have the physics that we have, you're stuck. You have right. to postulate a new physics, new quantum mechanics? Well, it's, they postulate a breakdown or an alternative to the physics we see very early in cosmic history, structured in such a way that you would get, get this multiverse, this infinite number of universes with possibly different physical characteristics. All right, so they're, they're postulating a hypothetical set of universes out there, and because we don't have enough time in our universe to have evolution occur to create life on Earth, they're saying somehow in one of these other universes, what? Well, one of these other universes, like you'd have all different physical characteristics. And, but if you've got an infinite number of universes, there's going to be some of those universes with the just right physical characteristics. And if that sum is large enough, maybe you can explain these extreme mathematical improbabilities without invoking a personal divine being to structure this life. That's the basic appeal. Okay, and what's the problem with all this? Well, the first problem is it is a metaphysical appeal. It's not something that flows out of the physics of the universe we see. You're, You're appealing talking to, to scientists something saying it's not scientific. It, you're appealing to something beyond the physics to make this work. Uh, the more fundamental problem is it's a form of the gambler's fallacy. And a good way to illustrate that would be to flip a coin. I got a quarter here, and I flip it. What if I were to flip it 100,000 times, and it came up heads all 100,000 times? You'd probably conclude that the coin has been purposed to always come up heads. But someone committing the gambler's fallacy would speculate that maybe there's an infinite number of quarters. And if you've got enough people flipping them 100,000 consecutive times each, one by pure chance would come up with heads 100,000 consecutive times. Therefore, the coin is fair. Now, that's basically what the multiverse people are doing. They're speculating along those lines. And my challenge to them would be, well, before you bet on the 100,000th first flip of the quarter, wouldn't it be a good idea to pick up the quarter and examine both sides? If you see heads on both sides, then don't bet on tails. Uh, keep your money. Now, people say, can we really do that with the universe? I argue that we can. We can examine the universe in greater detail. We're doing that every day. And if in examining in greater detail, we see that the evidence for design gets stronger rather than weaker, then that tells us that someone has purpose that the universe take on those characteristics.
Bill, does the idea of a multiverse, many different kinds of universes, innumerable universes, does that bother your theism? No, it doesn't bother my theism at all. I think that God, as the infinite creator of all space and time, could create separate space-time manifolds or create a universe so vast that there would be different causally unconnected domains within one universe. So once you have a, an infinite transcendent creator, there's simply no problem with the scope of the space-time world that he brings into being. How about in quantum mechanics? As you know, there is something called branching or differentiation where at every Planck time, as they say, very there's, there's a branching of or differentiation of the world, so there's infinite numbers of us talking in different ways with very slight differences, and then you have a multiplicity of these mm -hmm. quantum mechanical worlds. That's one way in which theorists have thought to generate a world ensemble of universes, though I think that most quantum physicists would regard this as an extraordinarily implausible interpretation of quantum mechanics. My question for you is, is that bother your theism, however you generate Oh, no, no, it, it, it wouldn't bother my theism at all because God would still be the one who established the laws of quantum mechanics, who created the quantum vacuum and the space and time, the arena in Whatever. which all these reactions take place. So, as I say, once you have a transcendent source of all space and time, matter and energy, then he's free to create any sort of physical reality he wants. Cosmologists talk about a multiverse, innumerable universes. Do you think God created a multiverse? I must confess, Robert, that I'm very skeptical of this metaphysical hypothesis. I think that if we were just one random member of a world ensemble of worlds or universes, that we would be observing a very different kind of universe than we in fact do. What would that look like? It should include all sorts of improbable and, and absurd events uh, that don't happen because in an infinite ensemble of worlds, if you can get the events so improbable as the fine tuning of the cosmological constant, the low entropy state and so forth, then you should also get highly improbable events like a perpetual motion machine and rabbits wearing pink bow ties and so forth because those are less improbable than the finely tuned constants and, and quantities. Well, theoretically, those are occurring in other parts of this world ensemble. But if... Just not in ours. Well, but if we are just a randomly ordered member of this ensemble such that the probability is that somewhere these constants would be finely tuned, then things that are even less improbable ought also to be con appearing conjointly. And yet we see a rationally ordered universe, and that cries out for some sort of explanation. In addition to that, a much smaller inflationary patch would be sufficient for our existence uh, rather than the large universe we see. And it is overwhelmingly more probable that if we were just a random member of a world ensemble, we should be observing a much smaller inflationary patch than what we do in fact observe. And I think this is really the Achilles heel in this multiverse hypothesis, that uh, if we were just a member of a multiverse, randomly ordered, then it is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly more probable we ought to be seeing a very different kind of universe than the uh, rationally ordered world that we do in fact see. I'll start off from my left here. If you can keep the question focused, I'll do my best to answer it. <clears throat> As a Christian man, how do I defend the Bible or the scriptures to those who are secularists or pluralists who don't view the Bible as authoritative? You all heard the question. <clears throat> and I think, uh, please give me your name. Brad Hubbard. Brad, I think um, the the seriousness of that question for many, many years has been felt more in certain parts of the world, and now it is felt very seriously here, too. Uh, once upon a time, one could uh, easily say that the Bible says so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, the listener would be very uh, eager to listen to it, but now one has to defend the very authority 
that which you are, uh, from which you are presenting your case. It is very important any time you are presenting the gospel message to an honest skeptic, and that's an important statement. Sometimes you will run across a dishonest skeptic or one who's trying to really raise question after question after question and uh, is not really hoping you'll have an answer but hoping you'll stumble so that uh, everything can be set in reverse. But if you've got an honest skeptic, the way you start answering those questions is by asking questions of the questioner. And if you, Jesus did this repeatedly, if you notice the number of people to whom he talked who came to him with a question, he questioned the questioner because the question the questioner does two things. It, opened, it helps the questioner to open up within his or her own assumptions. And number two, then it determines the entry point of the discussion. To start, for example, with, an, with a naturalist with the place of the miracles, it would be pointless because the naturalist will just dismiss the possibility or the relevance of the miraculous. But on the other hand, if the naturalist does admit that there are moral struggles that we all live with, that we need to find an absolute in some way, then you move towards that argument that without the possibility of framing a transcendent objective basis for morality, you cannot really answer the questions of right or wrong, good and bad. Pragmatism is the only hope that we have. So you're actually what you're doing is building a worldview from the existential tug point of the questioner. And that's where you start. You start where the existential rub is legitimately felt. To cerebrally go with the documents of the Old and the New Testament, for example, as important as it might be for, ex for a theological student or a seminarian, uh, to, the, to many a questioner, that, uh, that, is, uh, that is totally unimportant, or at least they just dismissed it as not able to stand up to the scrutiny of, uh, of, uh, of study of document authenticity and so on. So you have to go from a worldview and the particulars of the worldview at which the points are broken. I, I'll tell you why I find this so important. If you go to parts of uh, the Middle East today, for example, where you will find somebody from an Islamic background who's becoming a Christian, 99% of the times, you can check this out, you will find the person who says, I have now committed my life to Christ from that former belief system, will say to you, it either happened because of a dream he or she had, or a vision he or she had, or the loving example of another Christian that won them over. After they come to know Christ is when the apologetic struggle begins, because the need has been met existentially, and now the questions are being phrased, they don't know how to deal with the questions that are being tossed. So if God himself comes to individuals on the basis of their deepest felt needs and struggles, I think that's where we need to begin to. The woman at the well had all kinds of questions about, about uh, worship in this mountain or that mountain. And he pointed out to her what her real problem was, that her life was fragmented, it was broken, her life was shattered, and he knew everything about her and yet offered her the drink that would make her never thirst again. So I think you have to deal with it at the felt point of the individual struggle. The other intellectual issues are very real, but they are not to be brought in at an introductory stage because it just leaves it in the cognitive realm without dealing with where the struggle really is. Now, if the person says to you outright, I cannot accept the Bible as authority for the following reasons, then you begin there. But if you are introducing the scriptures and the person says, yeah, I don't, I don't accept that, uh, and uh, you move, see in the conversation, say, why not? Well, you know, I really don't believe a God of love who's all powerful can allow so much of evil and suffering in this world. Well, then that's where you begin the, the, the response, I think. And guys, we're going to talk about when man was created, day six. Let me read the record and let's find out if the Bible and science square up here. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds. And down it says, and then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. What's going on here, Kenneth? This is really a critical section of scripture, John. God creates the land mammals, but he also creates man. 
and s some really important ideas here. He creates human beings in his expressed image. Now, he takes the, the dust of the ground, the same dust of the ground that he's created the animals. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to realize biblically, we shouldn't be surprised if there's some kind of physiological affinity between animals and humans. Yet, when he breathes into the dust of the ground, he creates a living soul. I think we should anticipate from a biblical model that human beings will be like and unlike animals, just as we will be like and unlike God. We're created in God's image. While scripture doesn't tell us explicitly what that means, it certainly implies our rationality, our ability to make moral choices and to deliberate, that we're relational creatures, we communicate, uh, that we are capable of powerful uh, actions in the world, taking dominion, and that we are soulish and spiritual creatures. And so, and in light of uh, what we know today, he creates uh, males and females, uh, and they then have marriage. And so, some critical cultural, philosophical, and theological truths there in day six. Okay, the account says three specific kinds of land mammals are made here talk about what that is scientifically. Yeah, this is different from the fifth creation day where it addresses birds generically and sea mammals generically. The sixth creation day talks about three specialized kinds of land mammals. Land mammals that God creates to cohabit the planet with the future human beings. And two kinds are long-legged and one kind is short-legged. The short-legged ones, the ones that are built close to the ground, I think are referring to rodents and rabbits, maybe other creatures with short legs. And the long-legged ones we note are in two categories. There's the wild and then there's the, the biama, uh, which I think is reference to the herbivores, which are relatively easy for human beings to tame. And then the wild animals, I think, is a reference to the carnivores, although difficult to tame, make excellent household pets whereas the herbivores do not make good household pets. All right, Fuzz, let me come to you. The fact is the Bible says God created man, okay? What's the parameters from the biblical genealogies? What's the longest space of time where we've got to say, that's it, we can't go any further than that? And then compare that with science. What are the parameters there for the, for the science area? Where does man show up? From the genealogies, you can infer roughly anywhere from 10,000 years ago to probably 100,000 years ago, that's the window. The most likely time frame would be in the 50, 40, 50, 60,000 year window. Uh, from genetic studies of modern human populations, we see a date for the origin of man in the neighborhood of 50,000 years ago. The archeological record shows a sudden burst of human culture at that same time frame as well. So the scientific evidence is fully compatible with what the Bible teaches about the origin of man. Now, we've seen that the Bible claims to be the Word of God, but some other religious books do as well. Let's compare the evidence that the Bible offers as proof for being the unique Word of God with the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus, or the Quran of the Muslims, or the Book of Mormon of the Mormons. Listen. Let's take a look by comparison at some of these other books. Are there miracles in the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindus, uh, saying that this is the Word of God? There were no miracles. How about the Quran? As a matter of fact, in the Quran, Muhammad refused to perform miracles. And the interesting thing is, uh, they say Jesus performed miracles in the Quran, including resurrecting from the dead. They say God used to perform miracles through his prophets to confirm that they were prophets. And then when Muhammad himself was asked, perform a miracle to prove that you're a prophet, he said, here, read this surah, read this chapter of the Quran. In other words, he couldn't come forth with the credentials. He had the claim, but he had no credentials to prove it. What about the Book of Mormon? The Mormons say, that's the Word of God. The problem is, the Bible tells us one way you can test to see whether a prophet is telling the truth or not is whether he makes prophecies that are false. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Joseph Smith predicted that the temple would be rebuilt in Zion, Missouri, and even gave the date for it. Didn't happen. False prophecy. The Bible gives hundreds of predictions years in advance that are literally true and I want to take a look at those in a little more detail. 
the Bible claims to be the Word of God, and the Bible proves to be the word, word of God. Number one, it proves to be because the authors of Scripture were confirmed by miracles. Moses, Elijah, uh, Jesus, the New Testament writers, the Apostle Paul. Second, the Bible proves to be the Word of God by supernatural predictions made hundreds of years in advance. There is no other book in the world where there are literally hundreds of predictions made hundreds of years in advance, even by the dates that critics accept, that came literally true. For example, the Bible predicted that Jesus would be born of a woman in Genesis 3.15, that he would come from the seed of Abraham, Genesis 12, that he would come from the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49, that he would come of the dynasty of David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that he would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7:14, that he would be born in the city of Bethlehem in Micah 5:2, and that he would be crucified, get this, that he would be crucified and killed 483 years after 444 B.C., which is exactly, exactly what happened in Daniel chapter 9. Because Daniel said 483 years from the time of the command to build the temple, rebuild the city of Jerusalem, that the Messiah would be cut off. Uh, that happened literally because between 444 B.C. and 33 A.D. is literally 483 years. You say, wait a minute, you must be on modern math. Uh, much learning doth make thee mad. No. 444 plus 33 is 477, but these are lunar years of 360 days. 12 times 30 is the Jewish calendar. You have to add five more days. So five days times 483 years is six more years, and 477 and six is 483 exactly. Now show me any book in the world that predicted something that would happen hundreds of years in advance, what city, how, uh, what year, what dynasty, what ethnic group, Jesus came and literally fulfilled all these predictions. This is a supernatural book. JP, I'm going to ask you a question that um, ordinarily I wouldn't do in, uh, in, in, in polite intellectual circles. Let's the have it. <laughs> And that is, do you believe that angels, demons exist? I don't believe they exist. I know they exist. Uh, and there are two reasons. So the first one is that I'm convinced Christianity is true. So this is a system-dependent belief. Mm -hmm. If Christianity is true and Jesus rose from the dead, then angels are real. Second, because the, the belief system of Christianity, if you look, is at, the, true in general. look at the Old Testament, the New Testament, exactly. there are descriptions of beings right. that can be right. called angels and archangels. And, and if we characters. have grounds for thinking that, that this whole is true, is true, then this is a part of that. So it gets and, piggybacked. And you, can, yes, and you can't dismiss it as allegory right. or metaphor. Right. Because it's a they, part of the system and, it, and it's an right. important now, part. Now, some people would try to dismiss it as right. being a, but, but a, devel a developing theology yeah. that this was part of the that's archaic system. And it's revisionist. <laughs> uh, so, so that's the first reason. Secondly, there are just too many credible, intelligent people who've had encounters with angels and demons to, to, to dismiss it. I mean, Peter Shockey did a documentary. Uh, he was on the Oprah Winfrey show, uh, uh, and, and he wrote a book on it on uh, rumors of heaven. And uh, he interviewed people that have had real encounters with these. I myself had an encounter with three angels that was very, very real. Wow, well, we were dealing with a lot of stuff now. Let's get it. First of all, being on Oprah Winfrey is not necessarily a, a demonstration of fair, truth. Fair, <laughs> fair. Now, I'm more interested in your <laughs> encounter with, with three angels than yeah. I know what happened on Oprah yeah, Winfrey. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. I went to a church two years ago to speak, and a woman came up to me afterwards and said, Dr. Moreland, you're going to think I'm crazy. But I'm telling you, while you were speaking, there were three angels. Two were standing on either side. There was a third one taller than you, standing over your head, and they had white robes, but I couldn't see faces in them. And I thought, thank you very much, ma'am. You're a very dear person. Let me get out of here. <laughs> Eight to ten months later, I was going through a very difficult emotional time, and I was laying in bed one night, and I said, Lord Jesus, I don't know if those angels were real or not, but if they were real, would you send them back to me, and would you let me know they're here? to comfort me. Went on, went to sleep that night. Robert, less than a week later, I get an email from one of my graduate students 
This guy is, is a graduate student in philosophy. His wife's doing a PhD in philosophy. He's a rational guy. He sends me an email and says, Dr. Moreland, I've got to tell you something, and I've know how to tell you this. I've asked three or four of the grad students if I should let you know this. But he said three days ago in class for 10 to 15 minutes I saw three angels standing around you. There was one on either side of you. There was one standing behind you that was looking over your head and taller than you are. And I know for sure I saw them. And if you want me to come and tell you about it, I'll do it. Well, I mean, I was blown away. I never told anybody about this prayer request. Uh, the, the odds of me asking God to send three angels to me and letting me know about it, which, by the way, I had never done in my life up to that point. And having someone walk up to me with less than a week later and say, I saw three angels, well, he brought a picture of it. And I interviewed him in the office, and he said, listen, I respect you so much. I'd want, I, I would never tell you this if I wasn't sure. I rubbed my eyes. I said, well, why didn't you say something in class? He said, I was scared to death. I didn't know what to say. I thought you'd think I was crazy. Well, he pulls out the picture. And the angels are exactly like this woman described them in this church. Now, was I believe... It was a drawing that he did? It was a drawing. He showed me like where I'm lecturing. He was sitting over near the the windows on the wall, I know where he was sitting in the classroom. He showed me, and there was one on either side, and there was a taller one standing behind me. Don't these angels ever want to have different positions? They always, they, 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 they're required to be in the same place? Well, actually, what was interesting was that if he were simply making this up, number one, I don't know how you explain the coincidence with the fact I just asked God about, to answer that Did prayer ever, less than a week earlier. Did you ever tell anybody about your encounter with the woman? Uh, when no, you never told a person. Anybody else overhear her tell you that? No, because that was up in Seattle, Washington, and all this is down in Southern California. There was no way that this guy could know anything about that. This is, at, at the very least, an unbelievably improbable coincidence. And I believe the most reasonable explanation is that he actually saw something. And I asked him, do, do you see this stuff uh, regularly? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. He said, in fact, I was afraid to tell you. So, so that was an experience that's hard to dismiss. If, if, if this really occurred, and I'm not disputing a first-person account of, of anything, I, sure. I certainly believe that you believe it. I, I respect you enough yeah. to do it. Sure. But uh, I have to tell you, honestly, that this does not uh, 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 move me one nanometer yeah. in terms of my belief or non-belief right. in, in this. And I'm trying to think, why doesn't it? It should. I really respect you highly. Um, and, and, and so many questions fill my mind when I, uh, that, that, I, in, in, that, that undercut this as a, as a, as a demonstration. Um, if, this, if this is real and this is something that God does, why isn't it done more often? It what is. What was the, pur the purpose but, of it? You walk into I any just don't, You just don't you, see it? No. You walk into any church. And you ask, how many of you have seen an angel at some time in your life? And you'll have 20% of the people. There are credible reports from the mission field in Muslim countries where angels are appearing to Muslims, and, and, and some of these are coordinated, happening to entire villages of 250 people at one time. These are not dismissible stories. They're, they're being... They're being testified to by well-educated, sometimes people with PhDs that are intelligent and thoughtful. So let's, <laughs> let's go on and, and, yeah. and, and take your assumption that angels and demons do exist. Uh, yes. We've established that. And ask, now, what are the implications of it within the self-consistent system? And I admire that you're uh, uh, using the self-consistency of the Christian religion and the Old and New Testament, because that's there. So now, what are the purposes of these angels? Yeah. What, are, what are they doing? They're, they're persons. They have lives. They're involved in this world. They're involved in inter interacting with God. Uh, there's a, there's a, a Francis McNutt, who has a Ph.D. in theology, was speaking in a church uh, a few years ago, and his wife, who's, who's a marriage and family therapist, was looking out of the congregation, and a little boy was looking up at the rafters. And she looked up there, and she saw an angel sitting in the rafters of the church. After the service was over with, this boy and his mother came up for prayer, and the mother confessed that they had been going through a terrible divorce, and this little guy was having some difficulties. And Mrs. McNutt pulled him aside and said, During the service, you saw something, didn't you? And the little boy said, Yeah. 
And she said, what did you see? And she said, I saw a man sitting on the rafters. And she said, it wasn't a man that you saw. It was an angel. I saw it too. Now, here's why that's important. It is actually the case that children have guardian angels. This isn't make-believe. This is real. And angels do protect children. Now, there is evil in this world, and so it's not 100%. Well, it seems like they're doing an awful job. But that's based on your assumption of what it would be like if they weren't on the job. You don't know that. Well, I mean, look at the continent of Africa. Well, what how do you? What are those angels doing? What would it be like what if they, they feed weren't these involved? people instead of just watching them? You are making an assumption based upon comparison with what the world would be like if they weren't involved. I can't imagine it worse in some of those places. Well, then you need to go over in Africa and talk to Africans because they will tell you that they have seen angels and that they have helped them tremendously. If they tremendously. had more food, they wouldn't see so many angels. If that. <laughs> now that is an ad hominem <laughs> argument, and you know it. <laughs> By the way, one of the reasons I believe in demons is because I have, I know men with PhDs. Who have, I have a PhD. Telling a PhD I, doesn't no, mean anything. Well, hold it. Doesn't it. mean anything. Crazy I, it, people it, have PhDs. Stay with me. I'm trying to say that these aren't hysterical people that grab anything that comes along. But they, in exercising a demon from a person, had the demon say things about the individual that were embarrassing to him in front of other people that no one knew about. Now, when you get a personality charging you with an event that you did at a certain time in a certain place that no one knows about but you, and they're accurate, that is not multiple personalities. What do you think about all the seances, occult experiences? I mean, that's a whole other world. ESP, parapsychology, this whole uh, uh, world that it's some yes. scientists are believing that. And, yeah. And, uh, a lot of it's purely psychological. A lot of it's uh, testing the limits of the powers of consciousness. Some of it is dangerous and demonic. And would you put uh, the kinds of, of scientific testing of ESP and parapsychology in that category? No, I think, I think scientific testing with ESP is an attempt to discern the powers of consciousness mm -hmm. in a controlled scientific sort mm -hmm. of way. Mm -hmm. I do think that there are occult phenomena that are extremely dangerous and real. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I were trying to 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 empathize and and, and, yeah, and believe yeah. as you do, right. I actually could have more confidence in demons existing yeah, yeah. from some of the evidence you're saying in right. the world than I do of angels. Right. Because demons certainly seem to be smarter than the angels in terms of what they've been accomplishing. Well, the people that are watching the show. Uh, tend to hang around certain kinds of folks. Uh, in, in, for example, people in the media tend to be politically liberal and more secular, and they tend to hang around other people that think the way they do. And as a result, their range of experience tends to be limited by their friends. Now, is this I an ad hominem hum, argument? No, it's a sociological oh, argument. Well, it sounds pretty close. Because I'm not attacking the people. If you, <laughs> let me turn it into a sociological argument. Okay. The Quickly. point is that if, if, if people would get out among churches and talk, and talk to people, you will discover that there's an awful lot more of this going on than people in elite intellectual culture are aware of. They need to get lives and get out among the hoi polloi. Or the, uh, I don't know what to call it hoi polloi, but, but, but people in those environments perhaps need to uh, have their uh, awareness level uh, appreciated so that some of the the the, um, the myths that they've been exposed to in, in their own cultures are uh, are properly evaluated so they're not believing in in, 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 in falsehood and that's why I cited the fact that some of them had PhDs <laughs> and that doesn't give me and that gives me no confidence whatsoever yeah. <laughs> well then you're arguing in a circle Robert. <laughs> well, I mean, so, sometimes that's that's where you go and maybe the subject of angels and demons forces you to do that. Well, I don't think if you ask people who've actually had the encounters and try to explain what happened to them without postulating real demons, this is just like postulating electrons. You see a range of effects and you come up with the best explanation and some of the phenomena can't be explained well unless you postulate they're angels. Uh, is there a finite number of angels? Yes. About how many? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, is it the more than 100? Yes. Is it uh, less than a trillion? Yes. Okay. Fair enough.
say something about the relationship between that claim, that God is timeless when he exists all by himself as a changeless being, and uh, the first event, especially in response to Davies, you know, Paul Davies, who yeah. says, because it's the first event, there's no before, then you don't need a cause. Uh, or you can't have a cause. You can't have a cause. You can't even have one. Uh, you can't require one, certainly. Uh, now, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly how you respond to that and why now the claim that God is timeless up to that point. So okay, yeah, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems to me that Davies and others like him who have pushed this objection are forgetting an obvious way between the horns of the dilemma. And that is to say that God's creation of the universe is simultaneous with the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. So that the cause need not be temporally prior to its effect. It can be simultaneous with the effect. And we experience simultaneous causation all the time. Uh, Kant gave a famous example of a heavy ball resting on a cushion uh, being a, a uh, cause of a depression in the cushion. And the ball and the cushion could have existed in that form from all eternity. There never had, had to be a beginning, theoretically I'm speaking here. And yet you would still say that the ball is the cause of the depression, even though the cause and the effect are, are simultaneous. So as long as it makes sense to talk about simultaneous causation, I would say that God's creation of the universe would be a prime instance right. of simultaneous causation and occurs at the for convenience sake at the moment of the singularity of the day. But weren't you willing to leave aside his, his false assumptions about the direction of causation and answer them? Oh, yes, yes. Way. What I said was there, I said leaving aside the faulty assumption that a cause has to precede its effect yes. in time. I said he erred in thinking that because physical time began at the Big Bang, that God couldn't have existed prior to the Big Bang in metaphysical time. Exactly. Well, the Montanist movement was a movement that uh, began in the middle of the second century, uh, following the church's struggle against the Gnostic movement, which was a non-Christian movement, really. Uh, Montanism arose among the Christian community in Asia Minor near uh, Phrygia. And it's called the Montanist movement because its founder was a man by the name of Montanus, who was concerned about the uh, uh, diminishing of the life and the spirit and, and of the prophetic ministry of the ap apostolic church. And he believed that uh, a new age was coming to pass in the middle of the second century, the age of the Spirit. And he was to be the passive recipient of the Holy Ghost to, to lead this movement. In fact, some sources say that Montanus believed that he himself was the incarnation of the Holy Ghost. And so he uh, had with him two lady prophetesses, uh, Prissa and Maximilla were their names, and together they made uh, prophecies about the end times principally, that they announced that the Spirit had revealed that Christ was going to return very soon and that He was going to return and set up His kingdom in Phrygia, not in Jerusalem, but in Phrygia, and that <clears throat> He called people to enter into a rigorous type of asceticism, denying uh, all kinds of things, including, including eating meat. And uh, he got quite a following. And at the same time, it was disruptive to the church, and Montanus uh, was condemned as a heretic by a synod in the second century church. But the influence of Montanus lasted well beyond himself and his prophetesses. The last one died, uh, I believe it was Maximilla died, like in 179, somewhere like that, and uh, the influence included among their uh, adherents at one point, Tertullian, who was a very important figure in the early church. And it, the influences of Montanism lasted up basically until uh, the fourth century, until the ministry of St. Augustine.
Uh, I think that the uh, fatal flaw of the charismatic movement is that in practical terms, the personal feelings or experiences of the Holy Spirit begin to trump a sober, objective interpretation of Scripture and private leadings and uh, private revelations begin to replace the objective revelation that we have in sacred Scripture, which we know was inspired and uh, superintended by God the Holy Spirit, and we know that the Spirit is not an author of confusion and never contradicts Himself. And, and another way of putting it is, historically, <clears throat> Orthodox Christianity has understood that there is an inseparable relationship between Word and Spirit. The Spirit works in the Word, through the Word, with the Word, but not against the Word or even apart from the Word. And I think that the big practical problem in the charismatic movement, again, is that people uh, begin to trust their uh, experiences, their spiritual experiences beyond uh, or against, in many cases, the Scripture. I think a second very serious problem is the tendency to make a distinction between the haves and the have-nots among believers, of those who have the uh, empowerment of the Holy Spirit for ministry and those who don't. I think that flies in the face of uh, New Testament teaching. Now people ask, are there scientific errors in the Bible? Also, when the Bible rounds off numbers, isn't that a mistake? Well, Dr. Geisler answers these questions. Listen. Another mistake of the critics, forgetting the Bible uses non-technical, everyday language. The Bible is not unscientific, but it is a pre-scientific book. It was written in everyday language that anyone could understand, like the sun sets, or Joshua and Joshua 10 saying, the sun stood still in the sky. Now, it's no more unscientific to say the sun stood still than it is to say the sun sets. And what does every scientist every day in the United States say? He's called a meteorologist. He says, sunrise this morning, sunset tonight. No scientist I've ever heard of looks out the, uh, the western sky ablaze with red and says to his wife, honey, look at the beautiful earth rotation. We don't talk that way. The Bible talks in everyday language, too. Also, another mistake you'll often hear people make about the Bible is assuming that round numbers are false. Well, round numbers aren't false. Uh, pi is represented in the Bible as about three, and pi is about three. Now, more precisely, it's 3.14159 and so forth. But when it says that the little C out in front of Solomon's temple was 10 cubits across and 30 cubits around, that doesn't mean the Bible is wrong. It means that it was speaking in round numbers. Scientists today use round numbers. In fact, pi doesn't come out even. I saw a guy who recited pi to 10,000 decimal points. It took him three hours to do it. Uh, at the end of 10,000 decimal points, he was still an infinite uh, number away from the most precise number you could get to. But for all practical purposes, 3.1 rounds off to 3. For all practical purposes, 3.3 rounds off to 3. The Bible speaks in round numbers, speaks in everyday language. Another mistake neglecting to notice that the Bible uses different literary devices. For example, the Bible being a human book speaks in poetry, the book of Job, Psalms, written in poetry. It also uses allegories, like in Galatians chapter 4, it uses parables in the uh, first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, filled with parables. even uses hyperbole. Paul said in Colossians 1.23, I preach the gospel to every creature under heaven, meaning he evangelized the then known world. So the Bible speaks in human literary uh, devices because it's a human book. Another mistake you'll find critics using is forgetting uh, that only the original text, not every copy of Scripture, is without error. We don't believe that God inspired every copy. We believe that He inspired the original, and the copies are good, they're adequate, they're sufficient, but there are minor errors that crept in. Let me give you an example of one. Uh, take a look here at the screen. Look at this graphic. 2 Kings 8.26 gives the age of King Ahaziah as 22. 
But in 2 Chronicles 22.2, it says he was 42. The latter number can't be correct or he would have been older than his father. This is obviously a copyist error, but it does not alter the inerrancy of the original. Uh, there are many of these copyist errors in the Bible. It says 4,000 stalls Solomon's horses in one passage. Another says 40,000. That's the kind of error you like on the end of your paycheck, an extra zero. The Bible is inerrant in the original manuscripts, but not every copy is inerrant. Some of the minor errors in the copy. But I'd like you to notice something very important here. Take a look at this graphic. The first line uh, has an error in it. The second line has an error, the third and the fourth lines all have an error, but the error is in a different place. Now, if you had received a telegram with that first line, would you pick up your $10 million? Of course you would. Well, how do you know? Because, well, from the context, it looks like the first letter should be a Y, and Y means you, and U means me, and that means $10 million. Well, good reasoning. But if you got a telegram and had those four lines on and the error was in a different place, you'd be absolutely sure what it said. In fact, the more errors in the copies, the more you're sure of what the original said. We have over 5,000 uh, copies of the New Testament, and there are little errors in different places. But the more errors, the more we're sure of what the original said. So minor errors in the copies do not affect us getting 100% of the truth from the original, and it certainly doesn't prove there was an error in the original. No one has ever found an original manuscript with an error in it. There are non-charismatics, very prominent, faithful, blessed preachers, and theologians who are open to the charismatic phenomena, that they're open to healing and miracles and prophecies and, and tongues and signs. And the question comes up, why, why do you say you're open? What is the motive for that? Well, I don't know what the heart motive is. Maybe it's love and acceptance or uh, maybe it's uh, kind of a personal longing for something more in their spiritual life. But these are non-charismatics who, who want to give place for this reality, even though they haven't necessarily experienced it. What they do by that openness is provide a certain cover for the movement itself. Because the movement then can say, oh, look, here are these well-known mainstream uh, prominent uh, pastors and theologians, and, and they're open to all of this, and that then becomes a justification for something that is wrong. So could you um, explain to us what hell is and whether a good God is compatible with the reality of hell? I don't think that hell is what is depicted in medieval paintings of torture racks and pinchers and red-hot irons and things of that sort. It seems to me that the essence of hell is what Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 1.5 where he says, they shall suffer the punishment of exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And I think that is the anguish of hell. It is separation from God, from all that is good and beautiful and, and lovely uh, to be left with one's own crabbed and selfish heart forever. Um, and I think that is the essence of what hell is. Now, is this compatible with the goodness of God? I would say that far from being incompatible with the goodness of God, the goodness of God requires the existence of hell. I think hell is a manifestation of the goodness of God. Why do I say that? Well, because it shows that God is just. If God simply blinked at sin, he would not be perfectly just. And yet God is absolute justice. Every sin, every wrongdoing in the universe will receive its just desert. And so hell is a manifestation of the perfect justice of God. Um, and when you think about that, it is just as difficult a question 
as how could a loving God send people to hell, to ask how could an all just God send people to heaven? As a purely intellectual question, that is every bit as difficult. How could a God, a God who is perfect justice send anybody to heaven? And yet people never worry about that, do they? They never ask about that question. But it seems to me that there's a real dilemma here in the nature of God. His absolute goodness, and uh, not goodness, is his love, his love and compassion demand reconciliation and forgiveness. And so we ask, how could a loving God send people to hell? But his perfect justice demands punishment for sin rightly deserved. And so we say, how could an all holy God permit people to go to heaven? And I think the answer is Jesus. At the cross of Christ, the, the, the justice and the love of God meet. They meet at the cross. At the cross, we see God's justice as his wrath is poured out upon sin, and Christ bears the penalty for sin that we deserve. But at the cross, we also see the love of God as God himself takes on human flesh and bears the death penalty for sin that his own justice had, enact, had exacted so that we should never have to be punished and can go free. So at the cross we see the unfathomable love of God for us in what Christ suffered and endured for us and yet we see the perfect holiness and justice of God as the terrible punishment for sin is poured out. And so I think that the love and the justice of God kiss at the cross uh, and are reconciled in Christ's atoning death. So the existence of hell is in one sense our only hope because it shows that we do deal with a just God after all, that we are dealing with a God of perfect goodness and perfect justice uh, and that sin will be punished, evil will be corrected. Uh, but praise be to God, he is also a God of perfect love and compassion who provides the means of reconciliation with him. In this program, I plan to prove to you that our nation was established on a very strong Christian foundation. And you know, I have a rather unusual perspective for a Christian minister. The reason is that in addition to having studied the Bible all my life, I was a university professor of American government, American history, and constitutional law for 20 years before I decided in 1980 to give up my academic career and commit the rest of my life to teaching and preaching God's Word. I can say to you without qualification that our American constitutional system is a unique one because it was the first government ever devised by man that was based upon biblical principles. Its cornerstone was a belief in the biblical teaching about the inherently evil nature of man which produced a conviction that no person can be trusted with power. This belief that man's nature is corrupted and irreparable apart from the power of the Holy Spirit represented a radical departure from history. Until that time, most of mankind had always been ruled by kings who were considered to have a divine right to rule and who usually ended up ruling like they thought they were gods. The American colonists rebelled against such a king, and they had no intention of replacing the British monarch with an American one. What is amazing is that they did not proceed to establish an oligarchical form of government since most of the leaders of the American Revolution were wealthy aristocrats. But the vast majority of them were also devout Christians, and they were fully aware of the biblical teaching about the fallen nature of man. You can find one of the clearest expressions of it in Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah wrote, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And then he explains why. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Because of truths like this revealed in the Scriptures, our Founding Fathers did not trust anyone with power, not even themselves. They therefore proceeded to construct a government that would limit the use of power. Equally important was their conviction that the Word of God constitutes a higher law to which all men and governments are subject, that the fundamental rights of mankind are derived from that law and not from government. And thus, in the nation's Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote these words, 
we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. To put it another way, the founding fathers of our nation expressly rejected the traditional philosophy of humanism and its concept that man is basically good and capable of perfection, and that therefore those who are highly educated have a natural right to rule over those less fortunate. They also rejected the radical form of humanism that came to prevail in the French Revolution and which produced a reign of terror, namely a belief in the essential goodness of the common man. Again, because of their worldview, our founding fathers trusted no one. They refused to establish a monarchy or an oligarchy, but they also distrusted the common man. So they refused to establish a democracy because they feared it would quickly evolve into mobocracy. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our consideration of the Christian heritage of our nation. Because our Founding Fathers believed in the biblical principle that man is inherently evil and that God alone should be trusted, they carefully constructed a representative republic with an ingenious set of checks and balances. For example, in the original government established by our Constitution there was only one, yes, just one national official directly elected by the people, and that was the local congressman who was elected to serve for two years in the House of Representatives. Senators were not directly elected. They were appointed by state legislatures, and this continued to be the case until the adoption of the 17th Amendment in 1913, which requires the selection of senators by direct popular vote. Likewise, the president was not originally selected by a direct election. Instead, he was selected by electors, who in turn were appointed by the state legislatures. Over a period of time, the state legislatures began to allow voters to select the electors, but as late as 1824, more than a quarter of all the state legislatures were still appointing electors. Today, all electors are selected by popular vote. But even so, the system of selecting the president continues to be indirect, since voters are voting directly for electors, and it is the electors who directly select the president. Thus, in the election of 2000, George W. Bush was selected as president by the Electoral College by a margin of 271 to 266, even though his opponent, Al Gore, garnered 500,000 more popular votes than Bush. Our founding fathers also divided the powers of government between the federal government and the state governments. In the Tenth Amendment, they defined what was given to the central government. They prescribed what was denied to the state governments, and they stated that all other powers were retained by the states. Within the federal government, power was further divided between three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. And the basic rights of the people to be protected from all governmental intrusion were spelled out in the Constitution's Bill of Rights. That's the name given to the first ten amendments approved in 1791 and considered to be a part of the original Constitution since their adoption was essential to the ratification of the Constitution. In addition to establishing a representative republic with all sorts of checks and balances to protect against the biblically defined evil nature of man, our Founding Fathers repeatedly expressed the belief that Christian morality was absolutely essential to both the preservation of liberty and the stability of law. They emphasized this crucial point in their writings over and over again. Consider, for example, Samuel Adams, who served as governor of Massachusetts, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and was the organizer of the Boston Tea Party. He wrote, A general dissolution of principles and manners will more surely overthrow the liberties of America than the whole force of the common enemy. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. But when they lose their virtue, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. Religion and good morals are the only solid foundations of public liberty and happiness. The first governor of Virginia was Patrick Henry. He also served as member of the Continental Congress. He explained the significance of religion in these words, The great pillars of all government and of social life are virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor, and this alone, that renders us invincible. The most significant of all our Founding Fathers was, of course, George Washington. 
He served as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, Overseer of the Constitutional Convention, and First President of the United States. He wrote these words, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. Another member of the Continental Congress was John Adams. He was one of the drafters of the Declaration of Independence, and he served as the second President of the United States. Here are his strong and eloquent words concerning the necessity of religion. He wrote, We have no government armed in power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Thomas Jefferson was the renowned author of the Declaration of Independence. Additionally, he served as Governor of Virginia, he was our first Secretary of State, and he was our third President. He wrote, No nation has ever yet existed or been governed without religion, nor can be. The Christian religion is the best religion that has ever been given to man, and I, as Chief Magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. James Madison was a political philosopher who is considered to be the father of the Constitution and the father of the Bill of Rights. Madison served as a member of the House of Representatives and as our nation's fourth president. Here's what he had to say about the essentiality of religion to a government of freedom and liberty. We have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. The concept of the inalienable interdependence of constitutional order and Christian virtue was not just a characteristic of our founding fathers, folks. It has continued to be emphasized throughout our history. Take Noah Webster, for example. He is considered the father of American education. He was the publisher of the American Dictionary of the English Language in 1828. And concerning the importance of Christianity, he wrote these words, In my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. John Quincy Adams was the sixth President of the United States. He also served as an American diplomat, as a member of the House and Senate, and on the occasion of the celebration of the 45th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, he declared, The highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. Daniel Webster served as a United States Senator from Massachusetts and as Secretary of State. Here are his words concerning Christianity and government. No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. To preserve the government we must also preserve morals. Morality rests on religion. If you destroy the foundation the superstructure must fall. When the public mind becomes vitiated and corrupt laws are a nullity and constitutions are waste paper. William McGuffey was an American educator and author of the McGuffey's Reader, first published in 1836. He observed, The Christian religion is the religion of our country. From it are derived our prevalent notions of the character of God, the great moral governor of the universe. On its doctrines are founded the peculiarities of our free institutions. In 1838, the New York State Legislature declared, This is a Christian nation. Ninety-nine hundredths, if not a larger portion, of our whole population believe in the general doctrines of the Christian religion. Our government depends on that virtue that has its foundation in the morality of the Christian religion. In 1892, in the case of United States versus Church of the Holy Trinity, the Supreme Court of the United States expressed these words, no purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this is a religious people. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is a single voice making this affirmation. We are a Christian people, and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity. 
Calvin Coolidge served as governor of Massachusetts and vice president of the United States before he was elected to serve as our 30th president. He was known as Silent Cal because he seldom expressed himself about anything. But he had some prophetic words about the importance of the Christian faith to the continuing existence of our nation. He wrote, the foundations of our society and our government rest so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be politically universal in our country. In 1931, the United States Supreme Court in the case of United States versus McIntosh made this proclamation, we are a Christian people according to one another the equal right of religious freedom and acknowledging with reverence the duty of obedience to the will of God. Peter Marshall was a Scottish American, a preacher who served as a pastor of New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. He's often referred to as the Church of the Presidents. Peter Marshall also served as a chaplain of the United States Senate. In a prayer offered before the Senate in 1947, he said, May it be ever understood that our liberty is under God and can be found nowhere else. We were born that way as the only nation on earth that came into being for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Earl Warren served as Governor of California and was the 14th Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. In a Time Magazine interview conducted in February of 1954, shortly after President Eisenhower had appointed him as Chief Justice, he made this observation about our Christian heritage. He said, I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it. I like to believe we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I like also to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. Dwight Eisenhower served as Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe during World War II. He also served two terms as our 34th President. He made this observation about the relationship between religion and government. Without God there could be no American form of government nor an American way of life. Recognition of the Supreme Being is the first and the most basic expression of Americanism. Ronald Reagan, our 40th President, President expressed a similar sentiment when he proclaimed, America needs God more than God needs America. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Well, as you can see from the survey of expressions concerning our nation's Christian heritage, that heritage has been recognized and lauded by our leaders from the beginning until the latter part of the 20th century. It has only been in recent years that this important heritage has been denied and disparaged. Even foreigners who visited the country recognized the significance of our Christian heritage. Take for example the French historian Alexis de Tocqueville who visited the United States in the early 1830s. In 1835 he published the first of a two volume study of this nation titled Democracy in America. He revealed that the intertwining of Christianity with government was very surprising to him. He wrote these words, Upon my arrival in the United States the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. And the longer I stayed there, the more did I perceive the great political consequences resulting from this state of things to which I was unaccustomed. In France I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom pursuing courses diametrically opposed to each other. But in America I found that they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. The Americans combined the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our survey of the Christian heritage of our nation. We have thus far seen how that heritage was grounded in the views of our Founding Fathers how it was maintained throughout our nation's history in pronouncements by our leaders and our courts, and how it was even recognized by foreigners who came to visit our nation. It has also been affirmed in a monumental study by two University of Houston political science professors, Donald Lutz and Charles Heinemann. It is a study that took them 10 years. It was published in 1983. They surveyed over 15,000 documents written by our founding fathers between 1760 and 1805 and discovered that the Bible was by far the most cited source 
comprising 34% of all quotations. In fact, the Bible was quoted four times more than any other source. And significantly, the next most commonly cited sources were Baron Montesquieu, William Blackstone, and John Locke. All of these men were strong adherents of natural law philosophy and encouraged the incorporation of biblical law into civil law. Lutz and Heinemann affirmed that the Pilgrims, the Puritans, and the Constitutional Framers all insisted on cementing the connection between law and morals by infusing biblical precepts into the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Even contemporary American Jewish leaders have asserted their belief that our nation is one that is based on Christian principles, and they have expressed their appreciation for that fact uh, and that this foundation has produced religious liberty for them. Consider, for example, the viewpoint of Jeff Jacoby, a Jewish columnist at the Boston Globe. He wrote, This is a Christian country. It was founded by Christians and built on broad Christian principles. Threatening? Far from it. It is in precisely this Christian country that Jews have known the most peaceful, prosperous, and successful existence in their long history. Don Fetter, a Jewish columnist and longtime writer for the Boston Herald, expressed a similar viewpoint. He wrote, Clearly, this nation was established by Christians. As a Jew, I'm entirely comfortable with the concept of a Christian America. The choice isn't Christian America or nothing, but Christian America or a neo-pagan, hedonistic, rights without responsibilities, anti-family, culture of death America. As an American Jew, I feel very much at home here. Michael Medved, a Jewish radio talk show host and columnist, agrees that America is indeed a Christian nation. He wrote, the framers may not have been mentioned Christianity in the Constitution, but they clearly intended that charter of liberty to govern a society of fervent faith, freely encouraged by government for the benefit of all. Their noble and unprecedented experiment never involved a religion-free or faithless state, but did indeed presuppose America's unequivocal identity as a Christian nation. President Barack Obama has repeatedly asserted that the United States is no longer a Christian nation, but he has never defined what he means by that statement. What about it? Are we still a Christian nation, or have we abandoned the faith our nation was based upon? You know, folks, there is certainly a sense in which the President is correct. Although 85% of Americans identify themselves as Christians, only about 9% at the most would claim to be born-again evangelical Christians. This means that most Americans are simply professing Christians or cultural Christians. But this sad fact does not negate the historical evidence that our founding fathers established this nation on Christian principles and that those principles still serve as the basis of our constitutional structure and our laws. The problem, of course, is that those with Obama's viewpoint are determined to cut America loose from its Judeo-Christian foundation. They have a classic European-style humanist worldview that despises Christianity and capitalism, and the result is that freedom is endangered. We are speeding toward a secular pagan society devoid of values that contribute to virtue and civility. And if this transition continues unabated, our system of government will not be able to survive, for it is based upon the assumption of a citizenry that is endowed with biblical truths. We need to pray for our nation as never before. We need to pray that the schemes of the secularists will be frustrated, confused, and defeated. And we need to pray for a national spiritual revival. As we do so, let's remember the words of Revelation 2.5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first. I'd like to conclude this program by sharing with you some interesting facts about our Christian heritage, many of which may surprise you. For example, did you know that Christopher Columbus attributed his discovery of the New World to the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Here's how he described it. It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel His hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because He comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. Our Lord Jesus Christ desired to perform a very obvious miracle in the voyage to the Indies to confront me and the whole people of God. Did you know that there were 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence and 24 of them were seminary graduates? Did you know 
that five days after the declaration was adopted, the Continental Congress approved the use of public funds to hire military chaplains, and the Congress also ordered the importation of 20,000 Bibles for the American troops? Did you know that General George Washington sent out a letter to his regiments which stated, The general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor so as to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of this country. Did you know that through all 50 state constitutions without exception there runs an appeal and reference to God as the creator of our liberties and the preserver of our freedoms? Did you know that the biblically based New England Primer first published in 1690 remained the nation's most popular school textbook for more than 100 years, selling roughly 5 million copies in a nation that had only 6 million people. The 106 lessons it contained were saturated with Bible passages and the lessons encouraged devotion to Jesus Christ. Did you know that the biblically based McGuffey's Reader, which replaced the New England Primer in 1836, was filled with biblical principles and religious instruction. It ultimately sold more than 120 million copies and was officially recognized as a public school textbook in 37 states. Did you know that almost every one of the first 123 colleges and universities established in the United States had Christian origins and purposes? For example, Harvard University, founded in 1636, had it as its motto, Truth for Christ and the Church. Also, its rules for students stated that every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And therefore, Christ is the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Somewhere along the line, as the school secularized, the motto was changed from truth for Christ in the church to simply truth. Did you know that the United States government issued Bibles to all its troops during World War II which contained the following statement from President Franklin Roosevelt. He wrote, As Commander-in-Chief I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now as always an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. Did you know that on the evening of D-Day, June 6, 1944, while Allied troops were landing on the coast of Normandy, France, President Roosevelt read a six-and-a-half-minute prayer over national radio asking God to grant the troops a victory. Here is an excerpt from that prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts. Did you know that the words under God were not added to the Pledge of Allegiance by Congress until 1954? Did you know that In God We Trust was not adopted by Congress as our nation's national motto until 1956? It first appeared on a two-cent coin in 1864, and since 1938 all U.S. coins have featured the inscription. The motto did not start appearing on paper money until 1957. Did you know that both chambers of the House and Senate our National Capitol building feature the inscription, In God We Trust, on their walls. Did you know that President Obama has consistently stated that our national motto is E Pluribus Unum, and not In God We Trust? Well, that's our program for this week in celebration of our nation's birthday. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you will be back with us next week. Until then, this is the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our Redeemer is drawing near.